Hi, I'm Andrew Dubber. I'm the director of Music Tech Fest, and this is the MTF Podcast. For every piece of music you hear these days, whether it's streamed, downloaded, in your VR headset, or on some other format, there's a piece of technology that got it to your ears. Technology that got it to your home. Technology that got it to the distributor. Technology that made it possible to even exist in the first place. And behind all those technologies are the people who make them. The people who run the companies. The people who do the deals, and join the dots. Vicky Norman has been one of those people since these days became these days back when we started moving music files over the internet. She's been the president of Seven Digital, the digital music provider that provides the digital music providers, and she's also been in charge of connecting Sonos to all of the major music services so they can all sound nice all around your house. These days, she's a consultant advising to new kinds of startups and platforms that use music. Platforms like Beat Saber, an immersive experience. It's a bit like Guitar Hero, a bit like Asteroids, if you're anything like as old as I am, and a lot like taking pop music and making it incredibly stressful by making it a life and death martial art. Now, Vicky's an expert in music rights, in successful music entrepreneurship, and about joining the dots so that brilliant new ideas don't get caught out in the minefield of copyright compliance. Of course, Vicky's in lockdown, so I took the opportunity to chat with her about digital music, her career, and her advice for anyone who wants to carve out their own innovative path in music tech. From a house on a hill somewhere in Los Angeles, this is Vicky Nauman. Enjoy. Vicky Nauman, thanks so much for joining us for the MTF podcast today. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. You're looking well. Is uh, the lockdown agreeing with you? Well, the lockdown, the lockdown, I don't know. It is not. No, it is not agreeing with me. I'm trying to do a lot of things around my house and at home and projects and whatnot to keep myself busy. But I really miss traveling. I really miss seeing friends and people all over the world and walking the streets of cities that are new to me. And I'm going a little stir crazy, but work is good and busy. And so, you know, I can't really complain. I'm healthy and that's all I can really ask for right now. Your job is very much about moving things around on the internet, specifically music. Does that make what you do easier to do online or is is actually going to places and meeting with people kind of core to it? Well, I feel like I can, you know, one of the things that I love is, you know, I love having lots of plates spinning. I love talking and working with lots of different companies and having my hands in pies and being able to see that you know, you start to see trends because you're up above the tree line. So you can see, oh, there are two or three companies that are working on solving this this similar problem over here. And then there's two or three companies working and solving on that problem over there. I can do that from home. I have lots and lots of people that come to me all the time and I can, you know, I can clear rights. I can do all of these things, but I feel like it's really industry events and these gatherings where I learn what's really going on beneath the surface. And, right. um, and I feel like the industry events for me are, they're, they're more of a bellwether of what people are working on. Hmm. Yeah. And we don't have that right now. No, interesting. And, and are we likely to, do you think? I don't think we will. Um, I think we're going to be doing things online for a while. And I, I've been trying to participate in, you know, in, in some of the, you know, doing some online panels and events and, um, and it's probably really good for people that want to join panels. And I've participated in those as well. And, you know, watching people speaking about different topics. But it's really different because you don't, you just don't get the networking and you don't get mm. the little conversations in the hallways and over cocktails. And, um, but I think we're going to have to make do with it for a while, you know, because, <laughs> because in America, we just can't quite get the mask thing together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Let's talk a little bit about uh, where you've ended up first, and then we'll talk a little bit about how you got there. So I, I guess what you would describe yourself now is as a consultant, I guess, primarily, but you've had some pretty lofty titles. You were president of Seven Digital, you were business development manager for Sonos. You know, these are sort of big areas of responsibility for big, really important companies in music tech. 
why? I mean, why you and why those sorts of jobs? Well, you know, it's so fascinating, Andrew, because there have been points in my life where friends or colleagues have always told me, why don't you just go to work with this big established company? You know, why are you doing all of these crazy things with companies we'd never heard of? And and I feel like for me, I have a really different perspective on it because I feel like almost every job that I've had and every big project that I've worked on has been a building block. And I've been able to learn something really significant, like, you know, going to Sonos in its early days when I knew, you know, I had been at Real Networks, I had worked on one of the first legally licensed services, I had done, you know, a DMCA, built a DMCA compliant service in Seattle. But it wasn't until I got to Sonos that I was able to take this piece that seemed to be missing for me, which was hardware, and put hardware, software and content all together. And Mm -hmm. so that was this, it was a, a huge learning for me. And then um, to see the elegance of what happens to music when you get that equation right. And then, it, then you know, that helped me at 7Digital and working with other companies like Bose and whatnot that I understood the hardware, hardware software content. And I understood that you sometimes have to order parts for your hardware, you know, 18 to, 18 to 24 months in advance of when you're shipping it, which is an eternity in the software mm. world. Um, sure. So all of these pieces seem to to me like they're pieces of a puzzle that I'm that I'm hmm. slowly putting together over time. So w- when it comes to business development for something like Sonos, when it's getting started, is that about doing the deals that allows, for instance, Spotify and uh, Deezer and those sorts of things to integrate with the service? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the first things that I remember. When I, when I got hired at Sonos, it was, there were only about a hundred people on, in the company and there were, and I was in Santa Barbara, which is the headquarters. And it was really after, only, after a couple of weeks, I thought, why did they hire me? You know, this doesn't make any sense. You know, everyone else here is an engineer or a soft, software or hardware, or they've come from that background. And I don't really fit with the culture. I don't really fit with people here. And, and then they said, well, we've already integrated Rhapsody into our product. This is 2007. Um, Mm -hmm. We've integrated integrated Rhapsody into our product, but we want a Rhapsody-like service that covers the entire rest of the world. So we want you to go and find it. And I was like, oh, okay, well, I don't need to go anywhere to tell you that, you know, there isn't a service like Rhapsody that covers the entire world because of rights and because of all of these other problems. But I did find Spotify when there were only 17 employees. And it was really fun. I had I can't remember exactly how I had gotten Daniel Eck and Petra, who was the lawyer in doing licensing. I'd gotten their information and I went up to Stockholm and, you know, and it was it was amazing be- to see it because it was it was just like any other startup, you know, really small little office in Stockholm. And uh, and sure. so we started working with them. But that was also one of the things at the time of doing business development in the music industry for a company like Sonos, that it's both sides. It was like, I had to educate the people at Sonos that, you know, there are significant problems with rights and rights infrastructure Mm. that's preventing these services from flourishing all over the world. So I had to educate them internally to set expectations, but then also go out and try to just find as many companies as possible. You know, Deezer was in its early stages at that point. And then vetting them and figuring out, you know, are they licensing things properly? Are they going to be around? It's a significant task to build something into your products. And so we had to try to vet them and figure out whether or not a company would actually be around in two years or not. Right. I mean, obviously Spotify is a little bigger than 17 people these days. But what was the hard one? I mean, I, I struggled. I mean, I use Sonos at home and I struggled for a long time trying to get Audible, for instance. And that wasn't about music rights. Yeah, yeah. I know exactly. Well, one of the things that we discovered really quickly at when I was at Sonos was we, this was an era where APIs weren't even really readily available. Rhapsody had an sure. API at the time, but it was, it was still very nascent. And what we had done is in the very first iteration, we had built we had integrated these services into our firmware. 
So we hard coded mm-hmm. things into it. And we very quickly also realized, oh gosh, you know, these streaming services are pushing out updates all the time, making corrections, taking down content, doing all of these different things that affect the user experience very, very minor, you know, very minor way in their own applications. But if you're in an API and you've hard coded something, you know, you have to push out a hard software update to do a a correction. So we started an initiative to build essentially our own API and I project Mm. managed that. I called it Fender was its, uh, was its code name because I felt like it was like an instrument. It was a really critical instrument into an entire band. And that was a real game changer because it enabled the third parties of any type to build and integrate a user experience into Sonos versus the other way around, which was not scalable at all. Right, right. Because the API of Sonos in terms of, for instance, the hacker community is also something I think they've struggled with a little bit of getting it out there or, you know, making something that is, um, you know, hackable, that is a hardware product that has to be, you know, sent out to market. I guess that sort of having an open API is a a problem. So was there a kind of restriction on that? It was just for particular services? How did that work? Well, when we when we first started out, we were, you know, we had very particular services in mind where we felt like for us, it was really about having that technology that was a layer in between what we had and what our th- what our partners had. And that it was mm-hmm. it was a way for us to onboard more more services. It was also a, a just a reality that we couldn't possibly spend the time that we did when we integrated Rhapsody. The first service was Rhapsody, Pandora, and SiriusXM. And we spent a lot of time building this graphical user interface into Sonos controller at the time, which was mm-hmm. the only way that you could really access these things. You know, there we didn't even have proliferation of smartphones at that time. And um, which is so, and like, I can't remember what that was. It's another world, isn't <laughs> it's it? It's another world. I can't remember what that was like. But sure. um, we knew that we couldn't really scale and we couldn't reach. And we, and, and I think a lot of this was as the result of all of my conversations and I travels all over the world that we very quickly realized that there are, there probably won't be one service that's going to be completely dominant. There will be many and we couldn't possibly create that many user experiences. So we needed to put it in their hands, but we also had to have enough traction to have an API that people would invest any time and energy in. And so it was, it was really a matter of making sure everybody was aware of the opportunity of the living room as opposed to just mobile and then, you know, getting them excited about integrating into our into our environment. Right. I mean, not too fine a point of it, but Sonos as a company has changed pretty radically since then. What are the, you know, looking at it from the outside now, do you, do you see, you know, do you recognize it? I, I hardly recognize it. I hardly recognize it. I still use the products and I just got, I've just recently gotten a couple of new Sonos products. And I think that in some senses the company you know to become publicly listed you know that it it needed a whole new leadership because i think the original founding leaders and some of the founding members you know it, it wasn't a, a company that was set on being you know doing an ipo or exiting and selling to some other company you know the founders really wanted to build it when i was there and it was also a real pioneer whereas now it's kind of competitive in this Wi-Fi connected speaker world with, you know, the Alexas and the truly smart speakers and, you know, Bose and some other players as well as just, you know, Bluetooth. But it, it, you know, this spring when they, I think it was, well, I guess it was like maybe a year or so ago last spring when they announced that they were going to brick some of the older devices for me, that was like, you know, a stake in my heart because those are the devices that I worked on 10 years ago. And we basically told everyone we will always support all of these devices. You buy them once and we will continue to update them. I was really glad they walked that back because I don't feel like that was the right status for the company to go back to all of the original buyers who were promised something. 
Sure. And also to create instantly a whole lot of landfill. A landfill. <laughs> landfill. Exactly. Exactly. At a time when we say, you know, this is wrong and we should be retaining, especially electronic devices that are just littering, you know, it's so toxic. But it's a, uh, I don't know. I, you know, when I still look at the, at the landscape on this, like home speaker systems, I still feel like this hasn't completely been solved. And we've had so much innovation, but I feel like the home stereo where people really dedicate time listening to music is mm. still not been reestablished in the digital world. So I feel like there's still a lot of room for Sonos and Bose and, you know, Harman Kardon and whomever else is, is trying to get in this, into this space to bring great music digitally all throughout our homes. It's, um, it's a very natural listening environment, and I feel like it, it needs its own dedicated listening, music listening experience. Is there an element of nostalgia in that for you as there is for me? I mean, I'm a, I'm a vinyl junkie, so I, like, I've got records lining my walls here, and my record player is at least 35 years old. Uh, and so for me, there's a sort of like a, a link to the past with the home listening experience. Do you have that as well, or are you very firmly fixed on the future? To be honest, I um, in this pandemic – one of the things that I decided to do was I bought a turntable and I had a small collection of vinyl. I gave most of mine away years ago, years and years ago, but I had a small collection of, of albums that I had saved that were really meaningful for me, you know, from, you know, when I was a little kid all the way into probably my college years. So lots of things from the eighties. And um, I love listening to vinyl. I mean, it, it's a different experience. And it's also like, I think that it wasn't until I got this turntable and I listened to my old records that I realized, yeah, there's certain music like, you know, that you just, if you're going to listen on vinyl, you're not going to listen to one song, you're going to listen to an album. And mm -hmm. so that's re that in itself is a really different listening experience than what most people do in streaming services. I like the blend of both of them because the first time that I played an album on my turntable, I was sitting on my balcony and I got a phone call. And the first thing I did was pick up my phone to, to pause, <laughs> <laughs> to pause the turntable. And then I realized, Oh my gosh, I can't do that. You know? Right. It wasn't quite that sort of turntable. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, but there is, I think there's some nostalgia for me, but I think there's also something about the just the, I know the joy of having music playing really loudly in your home. And it, there's something that it does to the human spirit. And that's also why I feel like getting music in the home right is still something I'm really passionate about. Sure. The, the passion comes through when you talk about the music, um, but what you do crosses over law, tech, uh, music, music industry, business, relationships. Where do you come into this from? Yeah, you know, the when I was, I, I would say that ever since I started working in digital, which was 20 years ago now, and um, I became really, really fascinated with all aspects of it. And at the outset, I thought, oh, I'll just be, you know, this is this new technology is going to be great. I'm going to go work at Real Networks and we're going to build out this company and we're going to legalize this. And in five years, you know, we will <laughs> we will be done. And, you know, it was radically different from that. And I started to see that, you know, I had come out of radio that I get, you get accustomed to having a road and having a roadmap and knowing, you know, knowing the way what's regulated, what isn't regulated, what the rules are, what the laws are. And what I loved about digital was that there were so many things that needed to be reestablished and that we were reinventing virtually everything. And for me, it was, it was like uncovering a piece where, you know, I thought it would be going into real networks and music net, which was the first, one of the first legally licensed services. I thought, Oh, I, I don't need to know that much about software. 
I, I'll just be the, I'll be the music person that manages the relationships. And, you know, I was producer, you know, so I was looking at P, I mean, working on the PL and, and I very quickly, I got there. It's like, oh my gosh, this is, I, I don't know enough about software. I really need to up my game because I'm forever going to be asking developers to do things that are completely impossible to do if I don't understand it. So mm-hmm. it's like, okay, back to the drawing board. I need to learn about software. And so I actually left real because I felt like I'm not going to learn here. It was, it, <laughs> that was the year that real network stock went from 96 to $4 was the year that I wow. joined the company. <laughs> so I really, really did not get the timing. I didn't get the timing right on that one. Right. Because the real player was the sort of the standard of choice for a long time, and then it just went away. Exactly. Exactly. Well, and it was, you know, at that time, the player, that at that level, that was really where the competition was. And so you know, like Windows Media, there was Liquid Audio and Real Networks, you know, Real Player, and then Windows Media came out, Real Player was mm-hmm. paid. So if you, if you were, you know, all of your, all of your content was encoded in Real Player, you know, you paid Real a subscription for that, for the encoding, everything. And then Windows Media came out and made it available for free, which completely yeah. upset everything in the landscape. And from then on, then there was a lot of innovation around different media players. And I think Real still has a business in that in some territories, but that was a massive, massive shift in the landscape to have all these different media players and audio formats. For sure. But you also had to learn about the legalities of things. You had to learn about the uh, the way business works in those sort of, uh, you know, establishing those relationships between organizations. I mean, it's, it's, it's a complex world, the world of uh, digital rights. It is. It is. It's, it's a set of rights and relationships and norms. And it's this multifaceted, it's this multifaceted piece. And I feel like it was really when I built the first DMCA compliance service that was at KEXP in Seattle, which was a, this kind of taste making station that had gotten some funding from Paul Allen and Vulcan. And so I went there after real. And that was when I, read the DMCA. It wasn't yet enforced because this was 2001 to 2004. It wasn't enforced yet. Sound exchange was just being set up. And I realized, you know, we started going through the law and started to see, okay, what are the rules of what we can play? Because if you're a radio station, sometimes you might want to play 10 songs from, you know, Sonic Youth or whomever And under the DMCA, you can do that on broadcast, but you can't do that on streaming. And there were all these rules that were in place in the early DMCA services to that that were designed to prevent people from um, using these new streaming services as a replacement for CDs. So, you know, you couldn't search and play on demand, but there are all these rules of interactivity. But one of the things that we discovered is we looked into the law and we said, okay, Well, there's a two week rule where we can record everything that's made available on our broadcast. So we can we can live stream it, but we can also record and make it available on demand. That's really interesting. And then we went further into that and I discovered you can't search and play things by name of artist and by track, but we were doing everything by program so we could timestamp this audio file that we recorded and then we could allow people to go back and listen to entire programs on demand, which is really what we wanted. So that if you, if you love the African music show on Monday night, but you weren't available to do it, you could listen to it Tuesday. That was like a crazy, you know, innovation at the time. And it, we yeah. were able to do it within the DMCA. And that was when I realized, okay, if I understand the way how to build software and I understand how the law works, then I can figure out how to make products. And once mm-hmm. you can figure out how to make legal products in music, then you don't have all these problems of building things and then, you know, you've built everything illegally. But then the next big thing was the rights and the relationships and figuring out, you know, how do you actually get things across the finish line when you need to license them? And that I look at what I did at Seven Digital of just licensing almost every imaginable business model, you know, like 
on-demand streaming, subscriptions, tethered downloads, hard bundles, soft bundles with telcos, um, you know, DMCA compliance services, you know, more interactive, but not yet fully interactive. And I was really burned out when I left seven digital, just because I felt like it was like Sisyphus, you know, I was just kept pushing this rock up the hill and it kept rolling, rolling back down. And, but now I look back at the Sonos and the seven digital pieces and they're so significant and they've enabled me now in my consulting business to make pretty good choices about the kinds of companies that I work with, because I've done this a lot that, you know, I can kind of quickly assess young companies on, you know, do they, do they have a good idea? Do they have the wherewithal to be able to build a product? Do they have the ability to raise money? Will someone, will an investor look at them and say, yeah, I want to put, I want to put money into this. And then enterprise companies, I can evaluate them of why does company X want to do this initiative with music? You know, do they have a champion inside that understands the risks and the potential and do they have backing and, Almost everybody has incorrect assumptions about what they think they need to do from a rights standpoint. They think mm. they know who, you know, oh, we only need to license the performing rights organizations, or we think we should be able to do this. And so there's always this moment where I feel like I'm about to deliver really bad news to you. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, you have to be resilient, you have to be flexible in music. And, you know, you have, you want to have a, your North star that you're driving toward, but how you get there because you're using the intellectual property of labels and publishers and songwriters and artists that you, you know, you're much better off if you scope and figure that out from the outset than if you, you know, ask like the whole ask for forgiveness is it almost always turns out badly. That ship has kind of sailed, hasn't it? <laughs> it really has. But it is surprising yeah. how many people still, uh, you know, they still, once they understand the complexity of licenses, that's where they always get to that point where they're like, you know what? We just don't want to deal with all of this. So we think we'd like to just plow forward and launch and not be licensed and we'll deal with it later. And so it still happens now just because it, it seems like it's like there's a romantic, it's almost romantic that we're going to build something and everyone's going to love it. And then they'll all come to us and it'll be kumbaya and then we'll, we'll get rights and we'll move forward. But it really doesn't work that way. You know, if, if you've infringed in the past, then when you are at the negotiating table, you have to clean up your past and you have to figure out the future. You're not in a great position to inspire anybody at that point. It does from the outside look like it's all set up to prevent stuff from happening, to, to stop innovation, to squash new ideas, because it, it seems, I mean, it seems like the motivation is we kind of now understand what's going on now. We're okay with this. We can deal with it and we can make money at it. But new stuff freaks us out. Is is that still what's going on with the music industry? I think it looks like that from the outside. And I think that it looks like this big, chaotic, you know, Blade Runner-like world that people look at and they're like, I don't understand the difference between a management company and a label and a distributor and a label and what's a publisher versus a publishing administration company. And why is there performing rights over here and money's going to the same place if we, you know, like, like, it just is this chaos. But I feel like that's part of what I love is being able to take an idea and a concept that a technology company or you know, someone in adjacent industry to this, a finance company, a tech company, they have an idea. And then to break that down and figure out, okay, how can I match make to the right people in the industry and figure out, you know, who do we need to talk to? Who are great partners? And then, you know, it, and this is a relationship driven business. So it's also like, depending on the kind of product or idea that a, you know, an entrepreneur has and wants to engage with music, sometimes you're like, well, you know, 
75% of the industry might not be right for you, but there could be 25%, the right artist, the right label, the right, you know, sometimes it comes down to, I know there's a, you know, a guy who's really, he's been tasked with innovation at one of the major labels and he would love this. Let's start with him. And so it's like, for me, it's like translating ideas on both sides to common language because these sides do not speak the same language. They don't understand each other's business incentives, breaking that down, and then finding people who are going to be really receptive to the idea. Hmm. I'm wondering how much scope there is for new ideas about getting catalog from music companies to people who want to listen to music. Well, I feel like the nine ninety nine a month on demand streaming like that. I don't know why anyone would want to get into that. I mean, yeah, I feel like we've solved that one, haven't we? We well, we've solved it, and it's it is the most expensive set of rights. And on top of that, the software, the development of taking thirty to fifty million songs and organizing them into a UI for people, and you know, optimizing that for mobile and web and in all different countries and, you know, backwards compatible into Android and iOS. And I mean, it, it's like the stack, the tech stack is high, the right stack is high and the money. You know, I mean, we have some of the most well-capitalized companies in the world that are offering this product. So I feel like I'm really not that bullish about more companies entering in anything to do with this. I feel like let that's going to be a battle to the death. Let all of these companies go. And they're all kind of morphing and innovating in their own experience. But I look at this like the pyramid of music where the streaming services are largely like radio, like they're the foundation for this. And what are those higher value goods and things that we can build on top? That pyramid at the top where you don't, it's not necessarily about accessing 30 million songs. It's probably about a really special experience or artists that you really care about. And so I think that's music being integrated into more artist centric things. You know, there's an explosion right now around live streaming and virtual concerts and ways to use technologies to bring the live performance into the home. Super excited about that. All labels and publishers are very open to that. Gaming. I've been working with company Beat Saber for the last couple of years and, you know, and and they were acquired by Oculus. So I'm working with Beat Saber and Oculus clearing music for that. We've had tremendous support from labels and publishers. And so I think that there's, I think that once streaming, you know, for almost 15 years, everyone was working to achieve streaming adoption that happened and now it's like okay what are these what what's next and most of the major labels have people that are specifically tasked with figuring that out and they're usually young people who embrace and are not embarrassed or you know intimidated by technology and um and you know i think augmented reality virtual reality all of these kinds of very deep immersive experiences and gaming, that's where I'm focused. Hmm. Is AI going to throw a spanner in the works? I feel like AI is going to end up just being a tool. It's going to be a tool that helps people, you know, songwriters are using all sorts of different AI software to help them break through writer's blocks. You know, they're not, it's not replacing songwriters, but People are using tools. And then I think from a business standpoint of recommendations and understanding um, and machine learning, uh, you know, about all sorts of different aspects of music, it's, I think AI is going to be a huge part of it. I don't personally think that we have, um, you know, an AI, you know, that we're going to have an AI industry anytime soon, but I do feel like it's an important tool. What about AI that doesn't create music, but is trained on listening to large catalogs of it? What are the implications of that, do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, we haven't even really, I, I don't even feel like we've we've seen the potential of AI and 
machine learning and, you know, these, you know, AI and these problems that they might be able to solve when we are considering the fact that music used to be this high touch white glove. And now we have 50 million plus songs that are available and everything where it's, it's beyond human capabilities to manage all of this. So I feel like we do need tools and we need not just data tools, but we need tools that are going to help humans curate and help humans make sense of all of this. So I feel like there's a lot of potential for using AI in a way that doesn't just completely disrespect music. You know, I, I think it's interesting. There, there are all sorts of different AI startups that are around creating music, but I feel like I'm much more interested in things that are tools because we need more sophisticated tools in the industry right now. Sure. And it feels like, I mean, for instance, you mentioned Beat Saber before, which is very much a way of experiencing music that we haven't seen before. I mean, it kind of makes pop music stressful. <laughs> but do you think that that sort of experience for the user is something that's, uh, that's a, a place for innovation? I really do. I really do. Because I think that whenever I'm involved in a project, I always look at, you know, is this going to be meaningful to the consumer? Is it going to be meaningful to labels and publishers? And it's hard to get both of those things correct. Because the, you know, oftentimes adoption is a lot slower because of all these big tethered relationships in music. And so sometimes things take longer. But I really believe that for most streaming services, if you're listening on your mobile phone and you're commuting, you know, you might be having a music first experience. But for the most part, a lot of music streaming is now running in the background. It's my, you know, my audio wallpaper. It's the thing that accompanies me while I cook and I work in my garden and I, you know, go about my daily tasks. It's radio. Yeah. Yeah. But I feel like the power of music, especially when you think about live music, the power of it is that you are there and you're immersed in it. And I don't think we will ever necessarily completely replace live because there's something about the human experience. I think of being in the same room with people, the excitement, the tension, you know, everything is there. But I do feel like there are all sorts of experiences that we can build with technology that get us close. And Beat Saber is one of them. You know, when I play, if I play Beat Saber and I'm listening to Imagine Dragons song and I'm playing to that or playing Green Day song, I will have that song bouncing around my brain for days. And I hear it differently and I experience it differently. And I think that's really where I feel like the next horizon is. Is it about really bespoke you know, games and platforms and experiences, music for running, music for fitness, I think is also another area where I'm really excited. I feel like this pandemic has kind of, has kind of proven that we can do a lot of things that, at home, like work and exercise that everyone has said, oh, no, you have to, you know, you have to go to an office and you have to go to a gym. But, you know, that's, that's changing. And, um, and I feel like music is a part of, of all of these things. The new experiences that come up, I guess, bring their own issues. Um, but there are some issues which I guess are common to all of them. What are the really big issues in music tech? Well, I, I still feel like a really big and longstanding issue is, you know, tech companies come up with an idea of what they want to do with music. And they, you know, they've got it in their head, they have vetted it in their minds, and then it comes to what they need from a rights infrastructure in order to do right. that. And I think Peloton is a really good example of that, where, you know, they've now kind of had to scale back and remove some videos. But, you know, they want it, you know, when you want to go and you want to have every song that's ever available and you want to make a recording of something associated with that song, and you want, maybe you even want to change the speed, and you need sync rights, and you need public performance rights, and you need all of these different rights, and you don't know who owns what, it can just cause this massive collision of, you know, you being able to execute on your your business idea, and then it becomes something where you're in a hurry and you're in a rush when you're talking to the labels and the publishers, and that's never a good position to be in. And I feel like if, if you start from the beginning and you say, 
ultimately we want in two years, we want to have a catalog where we have all of our own direct licenses and we have access to a highly curated catalog of 10,000 songs from all different artists, all different labels. You know, maybe that's a North Star. It's like, great. Well, you, if you're a startup, maybe you don't need that at the beginning. Maybe that isn't your MVP. Maybe your, your music MVP is something smaller and that you build the right model, you build the right infrastructure and you get it right from the beginning with a smaller group of artists or maybe a small collection of music. And then you can gradually build and grow that over time. That obviously doesn't work for an all you can eat access everything where you need everything from everyone. But most companies that I think are operating at the top of the pyramid or that will be operating at the top of the pyramid don't need everything. So I feel like there has been a opening of the mind from labels as well. And that in addition to tech companies saying we want, you know, we see music as this great, you know, this great thing to integrate and help us engage with fans. And we want to build the next big thing. I think that labels have also kind of seen that streaming is here and it's it's here to stay. But what is that next thing? And honestly, I think that doing the having Marshmallow do that set in Fortnite a year and a half or so ago, I feel like that was really significant because it wasn't so much that People saw it as, oh, you know, labels saw it as, oh, there's a there's a way for us to make money. But in the A&R, in the marketing world, they see, okay, so you can do one set and reach 10 million people. Mind blown. And so, you know, and I've been one of these people saying to music for years, you know, look at gaming. You know, the, it's bigger than music and film combined, you know, lots of free to play and in-app purchasing and there aren't that many opportunities for music and the gaming industry to work together. So that, you know, when we do have a few of these, and I think that bringing live artists, live performances to life inside gaming environments and just music itself, I feel like that's where it is golden. And so I think that the, you know, any, any tech entrepreneurs that might be listening to this, I feel like, you know, I don't want to be discouraging because I feel like people, you know, people oftentimes feel like, oh, you know, that'll, you know, we can never get the labels on board and it's going to be too hard. But it really isn't, you know, if, if you take a thoughtful approach, you can do it. Can you reassure the tech entrepreneurs that the labels have sorted out their metadata now? <laughs> oh, we're out of time. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is the big problem now, isn't it? It's still a really big problem. And now it's actually, I feel like on the, I feel like on the, you know, on the master recording side, because of DDEX and because of creating some standardization about getting things from label servers into DSP servers via DDEX standards, adopting standards, it's not perfect. You know, there's all sorts of different versions of it. And, you know, some have forked into slightly different interpretations of, of a standard. For all intents and purposes, you know, metadata is largely gotten onto a track where it is being cleaned up. It's not perfect. And there's still all sorts of problems around, you know, issuing ISRC codes differently in different countries and having duplicates and having, you know, all sorts of misspellings. But I think that, you know, there's been a concerted effort over really 15 years to solve this problem. I mean, I remember when I was at Seven Digital and we would take in licenses and music from, you know, all over the world. And it was, it was a nightmare because everything was non-standardized you know, down to even the format and the bit rate and metadata schema and, you know, how basic fields are populated. I I remember at one point we had one of the labels that was issuing a different ISRC code for a different, for all of their releases that were at um, uncompressed uh, quality. So Uh you would end up having like an ISRC code, which is supposed to be attached to the, you know, the actual sound recording, but they would have different sound, different ISRC codes for, you know, you know, a, a 128 MP3 and then, you know, 275 and then uncompressed. And so it was like things like that. 
Right, because this is supposed to be the unique identifier that says this is this song and not any other song, right? Exactly, right. exactly. And yeah. then, and the same song at a different rate is now a different song. Exactly, exactly. And oh. um, and so so you know we've we've seen things like that getting cleaned up, and now we've got publishing, and publishing is exponentially worse because for every one song on the master side, there's one owner for every song on the publishing side, there's nine or 10. And so you don't have just 50 million identifiers. You have, you know, 500 million identifiers that are all associated with the composition, but they're splits of ownership. And so this is part of the industry's leaky bucket where Mm -hmm. there's, you know, you know, a lot of money that is traveling between end consumers and licensees and through all these different partners. But at every point along the way, if you don't match and you don't, or you aren't able to reconcile that this song was streamed and all 10 of these rights holders need to get paid and then it needs to go through all of those channels, that's where money just falls out. And it, you know, sometimes it goes into the black box, which can get settled. Um, of unattributed revenues, but there's also money that never even makes it there because it's caught in conflict and it's caught in, you know, disputes about ownership or some other kinds of problems. And so it's, it's just money that's due to songwriters that is just, you know, that it's like if you, I like to use the metaphor that if you, if you have your garden in the backyard and you go to your front yard, you fill up your watering bucket and then you have a leak in the bucket by the time you get to your garden, it's, it's mostly gone. And you say, well, where, where did that go? It's like, well, it's, it's everywhere between here and there, and you can't go and pick it back up. That's kind of the way the royalties are with, with music publishing. And it's being sorted out. You know, we have the MLC, which is the Music Mechanical Licensing um, Collective in the U.S. and the Music Modernization Act. I'm hopeful that the, that this piece of legislation and the the MLC will be a catalyst for companies around the world that have publishing data to start sharing data and not storing it in silos and start reconciling it. There's a lot of international publishers and writers that I think are losing money in the U.S. that they will benefit by participating and getting you know getting clean data in on the publishing side. But there's no. <laughs> I don't really see an end in sight to what we need to do to clean all of this up because we have the proliferation of creators and the proliferation of releases happening at the same time that we're trying to clean everything up. So it's, um, you know, it's going to be a long haul, but things are going in the right direction. Sure. But I, I guess there's probably a group of people with a vested interest in putting holes in buckets and making sure that they're underneath as they as they go past. Well, that's exactly right. I mean, there's, you know, a secondary industry around breakage and around not having accurate data, because if you don't know who to pay, then you don't have to pay them. But one of the things that I think is encouraging in this space is that I think the word is out now that, you know, that there are problems in this regard and that artists and create and actual composers that they're the ones that are really missing out and that publishers, smaller publishers are missing out. So I think that there's been a eye opening that, you know, companies that don't have good systems are probably not going to be the best choice if you're an artist or a writer. And so it's Mm. becoming a little bit more of a competitive advantage for companies to be able to say to artists of all sorts, that we have good systems and that we we can handle the volume and we can handle the micropayments in terabytes that are coming to us. And I feel like that is where the industry really changes. It's not, the industry doesn't change because a tech entrepreneur has a new idea. The industry changes when they see that they need to put on a different face and a different pitch to artists and to songwriters, because that's where that's really the lifeblood there. And I feel like the more that we can educate artists and songwriters about what they should expect from a label or a publisher and what they need to do for their own careers, the, the better we are at, you know, at solving some of the problems. 
A lot of the online discourse around this sort of thing is that the artists are these kind of embattled, uh, you know, victims of this system. And then there are these monolithic baddies, uh, that, whether it's the streaming services or the major record labels, or is the story more complicated than that? Or is it more interesting than that? Or is it just that there are people who have set up these monolithic organizations to ensure that artists just don't get their money? Well, I feel like labels and publishers to a certain extent are almost like venture capitalists where they're going to make a lot of bets and they're going to invest money in high risk situations where they're going to invest in, you know, ideally they find someone who is early in their career and has not yet broken and that they have the opportunity to to shape that artist's career. And, you know, and that's the same as what VCs do with with startups. And so you, you know, you might have 20 different signings on the label or publishing side and two or three break. That's pretty good odds for you as, you know, as an investor. But if you're one of the three that break as an artist, it's great. If you're one of the 17 and you don't get what you need or you get shelved or whatever, that, you know, that's not particularly pleasant. But I feel like right now, the artists have so many choices, whether you're a songwriter or a performing artist, you have so many choices about what you want to do, you know, whether you want to sign with a label or publisher or whether you don't, whether you want to own all of your rights, whether you want to have a team around you, whether you want to go it solo, you know, how you engage with your fans, how you release your music, when you release your music, you can do anything you want. There's so many choices for artists, and I think artists have a lot more power than they may realize. You know, if you're uh, up and coming, you know, you you can kind of map out your own path. And we're seeing, a, I think, a different generation of creators now that are di- digital natives. They understand everything. They're not used to having necessarily a huge team around them until the right time. But at the opposite end of the spectrum, we also have Taylor Swift, who was able to sign a deal with Universal Music um, that enabled her to retain um, some ownership and some control of her own masters. And that's a phenomenal thing that would not have happened uh, even a few years ago. So I feel like we're seeing on both ends of the spectrum of, you know, the half a percent of artists at the top, as well as the artists that are just coming out of the bedroom that we're seeing that they have much more control and more influence over their own careers. And it's just really a matter of deciding where, which lane you want to be in. It's 2020. Do you find yourself still having conversations about blockchain? (laughs) There are still some conversations about blockchain, but I feel similarly about blockchain as I do with AI. I feel like blockchain, it's an enabling technology. You know, it isn't, you know, blockchain is never going to completely replace labels and, and publishers and, and completely democratize things. Everybody who was out saying that a few years ago, you know, I understand, you know, you see the technology has a capability of it, but this industry will never, ever be completely disrupted by that because we have, it's all private. Everything is so private, but blockchain can be an incredible tool. And when you think about some of the metadata problems that we have where, you know, music gets released from an artist, goes to a label, and then it gets distributed to DSPs and then out to rights management companies to match with sound recordings to underlying publishing. And we've got data flying around at so many different touch points that when you send it out at point A, by the time it comes back to you at point Z, something has changed and that no one knows where in the chain a field has changed, um, a title may have changed, some other identifier is different or has been appended or modified. This happens all the time. And so I think like just in this one instance, if you think about permanence of data, And that if we had permanence of data where we weren't allowing all of these different touch points to change, that blockchain 
has a role and has a function there. It isn't about necessarily licensing. It isn't necessarily about disrupting and disintermediating, but it is a tool to be able to help manage the massive number of transactions and modifications that are happening. Or I think another really good example is change of ownership. When someone buys and sells a catalog or you buy and sell splits and, you know, and, and associated ownership of songs, that if you're, if you're acquiring a publishing catalog or you're acquiring a master catalog, that the, you know, in the DSP world, normally if, if, if a catalog changes ownership, everything has to be taken down at the DSP. So they say, okay, we sold, we sold our, our sound recordings from, you know, Sony to beggars. And then everything that was on Sony that was that catalog has to get ripped down. And that means even in the DSPs, the number of plays that you have, the fans, your subscribers, all of the data and, and the front end, all of that goes away with those sound recordings. And then it comes and gets re-ingested from no longer Sony, but now from beggars with several fields that have changed. And then you have to have the DSP rebuild everything on the front end. Right. By DSP, you mean the people who are supplying the likes of Spotify and Deezer and those sorts of people with the content? No, I mean, a DSP, I mean, like a Spotify or Apple or Pandora and that right. they have, um, they, there's a longstanding practice where they take everything down and then you re-upload and then you, there's a lot of work, a lot of wasted time and energy around that. And I feel like hmm. that's a really good example of where blockchain could be very useful. It doesn't mean that, you know, blockchain revolution, but it also, but it means that, you know, if we could just keep that music up there, but have permanence of data where we say, yes, on, on August 18th, it changed from Sony ownership to beggars ownership. Let's just change that field. Then we don't have to take mm -hmm. everything down. We don't have to take the sound recordings down. We don't have to do any of that. So I feel like there are things like that where, we, when you get down to understanding the tech and you get down to understanding the problems, there are some solutions there. Hmm. Now, we met in Norway. Do you want to tell me a little bit about what happens in Christian Sound? Because that seems like an important gathering and not a big public one like a Medium or a South by Southwest. Exactly. No, I, I absolutely love Christian Sound. And part of it is the people who gather there who are generally, you know, you don't have lawyers representing, you know, Google and Amazon in the room. It's not a huge anonymous group. It's a small group of very passionate people from all over the world who are thinking about the, you know, everything from an artist standpoint and from a creator standpoint of, you know, it, if you look at the industry and you say, oh, here's labels, publishers, DSPs, distributors, there's the whole ecosystem, it kind of makes sense. If you're an artist and you say, I'm going to create a song and I'm going to put it out, that same ecosystem has a very, very different view. And so we look at things around, you know, what is really happening so that that artists understand the landscape you know, what are the cultural differences? What are the territorial differences? What are, what is really going on in, you know, in some of these, you know, legacy organizations that don't have the right technologies. And it's just a group of people who really, really care about the landscape. I think one year, and it may have been the year that you were there, we started, we got onto blockchain, which was such a huge mistake, because it was like a group of non-technologists talking about blockchain sure and and so there was an ibm guy in the room to be fair there was somebody who knew their stuff yes 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 that's right that's right there was an ibm ibm guy in the room but a lot of the people i feel like you know we don't necessarily you know we don't need to have everybody in the world you know become a blockchain and you know distributed ledger expert but I think that the, you know, knowing enough to have an informed decision of whether something is good or bad and why I think is important. But I think the the gathering in Christiansen is, I love that it's in Norway. It's just a small group of people who are, are really, really passionate about, um, about how the industry is evolving. And as an American, it's especially valuable to me because I feel like in the U.S. so much of this is just around 
how can you build a tech company that's going to be big and, you know, you can scale and you can exit. And it's very much a commercial view of the industry, whereas in Norway, it isn't. It's much more nuanced. Right. And I feel like when we have these conversations about big industry and rights and and streaming and these sorts of things, what we think of is like the Anglo-American popular music industry. But actually what's at stake is, I guess, a lot bigger than that. There's there's stuff from all over the world and different languages and even character sets for, for the metadata. Is global music becoming more global? I think it is becoming more global. And I think that the at the last Chris Jensen round table that I went to, there was, there were a couple of people that also were doing really interesting things of looking at, um, you know, like, especially in, in Europe where you have a lot of small countries that overlap and that people frequently travel and live in between different mm-hmm. countries and how differently your music recommendations are if you're in, you know, Denmark versus Germany And, you know, and what what that means for local repertoire and what gets surfaced and what's associated with your listening behavior. That was really, really fascinating because I feel like, you know, we don't want the industry to evolve to a point where everything is is so standardized around the world that we don't have the local flavors. But it was really fascinating to look at screenshots of how different the different recommendations going granularly down into different categories of local artists and and international artists of how varied that is from country to country. Is this getting better or is it just getting more complicated? Well, I think it's I think it's getting I think it's both. I, actually, I feel like it's getting more complicated at the same time and I I think that the number of songs that are being released, the globalization of, of music. I mean, no one could have predicted that, you know, BTS and some of these, you know, K-pop bands would be as wildly popular in their own native language and, you know, around the world when that flew in the face of everything that that artists had always been told, you know, you always have to sing in English and you have to adapt to what the other cultures want. I feel like we are having this, this really big global explosion. But what happens with that is that, you know, the problems just keep taking on different dimensions. And so we have to fix things and build new systems while we're riding the horse, basically. And um, I feel like, I, you know, I look at things a lot from the business side and from the willingness to do business and engage and have some shared skin in the game. I feel like that is getting better. And I feel like the, um, you know, the, the, the gaps between the tech industry and the music industry are, are slightly narrowing. And I think some of that is because we've had people at music labels go work at, at Pandora or Spotify or whatever, and then come back. So they're sharing knowledge of different perspectives on, on the same industry. Right. And is it fun? It is really fun. It is really fun. I'm having a blast. I mean, despite the pandemic and everything else that's, that's, that's going on, I feel like the, you know, we're having an acceleration right now of, of innovation. And I think some of that is because in the past, all these technologies have been available, but we've had probably some resistance to doing anything that's going to to make live performances online be more meaningful because you they want everyone wants to protect this huge cash cow of live touring um so i feel like the pandemic is accelerating innovation not just in that but you know fitness and music using music for fitness companies in the home um, for dance, for, you know, rowing, for, you know, yoga, for all of these different, you know, cycling, all of these different things and gaming and, and live performance. And there's an acceleration right now to build really meaningful applications and use music in them. And so to me, it feels like a, a really, really fun wave to be riding at the moment. Fantastic. It sounds really optimistic and really energizing. So it's quite a nice place to leave it. Vicky, thanks so much for your time today. Thank you so much. This has been my pleasure. And uh, I, I appreciate the thoughtful questions as well. So thank you. Thanks so much. 
Cheers. That's music tech expert and consultant Vicky Norman. And that's the MTF podcast. I'm Andrew Dubber. If you want to follow me on Twitter, you can find me at Dubber. And Music Tech Fest is at Music Tech Fest, all one word. The MTF podcast is out every Friday, so if you haven't already, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Overcast, Spotify, or whatever your favorite podcast app might be. And if you like what you hear, you can share, rate, and review us. It really helps other people who might be into this sort of thing to find us. Don't forget, we're still doing the whole wash your hands thing. Make sure you're also wearing a mask, some VR goggles, and a pair of headphones, so you can be safe, be healthy, have a great week. And we'll talk soon. Cheers.